So my talk is, uh, does THR need a new paradigm, yeah, which is called the 3D balance. Now we know in life, uh, change is the only constant and everything is changing. And um, you know, these are the three gentlemen who changed our uh, approach on knee replacement. We now talk about kinematic alignment, anatomic and functional and constant alignment. We have Howell there, Mark Pegnano and uh, Steven. So if you look at the train, you, um, you might have seen this, whichever way you want the train to run, just by changing your mind, you can make the chain, uh, train run either right to, uh, towards the right or left. So thinking is very powerful. And uh, it was none other than Einstein who said, the important thing is to never stop questioning. So we must keep questioning everything. So there's been a fundamental rethink in TK and to improve function in the last decade. We talk about all kinds of alignment and how we get that. Now the question in 2023 is, is it now time for a fundamental rethink in THR to improve outcomes? So there's always this thing about the stability versus mobility and a lot of surgeons say that, you know, uh, they lengthen the limb little because, uh, because it felt a little lax. And so they are really compromising uh, limb lengthening for stability. And if you leave it loose, then you may end up And this. Uh, still, if you look at any registry data, limb lengthening as well as dislocation is still a, a common complication following THR. So should we accept this compromise? That's the question we had to ask ourselves. So there are three absolute fundamentals of THR, just like you know how mechanical element was the real base on which TKR was built all these years, all these decades. The three absolute fundamentals of THR uh, taught to us by Dr. Ranawath. Uh, the first is, he said, Ranavat said, you restore the socket center to the native location and thereby try and reproduce native biomechanics. So this is the Ranavat triangle, I think it was described somewhere in 1970, uh, where you need to keep your socket within the Ranavat triangle. That was fundamental number one. The second fundamental was to reproduce the, the original horizontal and vertical offset of the femoral head, either the X-ray or perop measurements, and you recreate that femoral uh, uh, you know, the biomechanics. The third was to ensure a very stable prosthetic joint at trial reduction. So these were the three tenets on which the whole THR surgery was built for the last um, 50 years. And the question is whether we should uh, revisit all these concepts. So looking at the first fundamental, restoring the uh, circuit center to the native inclination has been questioned by many. And here are two uh, cases. One is a primary dysplasia. One on your right is the secondary dysplasia, where it basically started off as an OA. And any arthritic process will tend to make the hip uh, migrate um, anterior superiorly, and that's what is done. And now we know that the best place to keep the socket is not at the anatomic uh, center, but slightly above where the best bone is. And that's what we do routinely. We've done thousands of cases like that, whether it's primary dysplasia or secondary dysplasia. And that's where I would like to leave my socket, because that's where the best bone is. And I'm not worried about it going uh, you know, a few millimeters up. I'll compensate that on the femoral side. Not only that, this is the place where you find that you don't remove any extra bone and not removing extra bone in the AP diameter is absolutely fundamental, especially when you're operating on very young patients. So this first rule of THR, restoring the native uh, center of the socket, has to be revisited now. If you want to preserve bone in young patients and you want to get the best available bone for your non symmetric fixation. So, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you may have, uh, you may want to keep it at the true floor, you may be a few millimeters proud, or you may want to keep it at the true center, and maybe two or a few millimeters more elevated. So small variations can uh, occur at the time of surgery, and we cannot leave it, we cannot leave the patient like that, and we need to do something uh, on the femoral side to compensate. So this uh, little high hip center has been published now, the 20 year follow up, uh, both by Dr. Ranavath himself, and uh, also by uh, Japanese series, 20 year follow up, that uh, mild to moderate hip center has got no long term implications and is a much better way of placing your socket. Hip number fundamental two is to restore the original horizontal and vertical offset. Now, we always talk about this, but what we don't take into account is the neck shaft angle. When the neck shaft angle is not the same as the patient's neck shaft angle, you are fooling yourself if you think that you are restoring the horizontal and the vertical offset. You are not, you cannot. Mathematically, it's not possible, although we like to think that we try to. Suppose the patient had an angle of 130 degrees and you put a 135 stem, you cannot restore the horizontal neck offset like in a unidimensional age. That's not possible. So only when you have a custom-made stem or a stem matching the neck shaft angle very accurately can you even hope to restore the anatomy of the proximal femur. So what, what we thought was restoring anatomy is actually a flawed. We are not restoring anatomy by any means. So unless you're able to match the neck shaft angle, Biomechanically, it's not 
possible to manage offsets like this. So recreating proximal femoral anatomy is possible only with a custom-made pro process. Then you can see, as I showed you in the morning demo, many hips dislocate very easily once you do the capsulotomy. So trying to make the, prost uh, the, um, the prosthetic trial very stable when the capsule is still open is absolutely flawed. Even the native hip is not stable when the capsule is open. How can you make the prosthetic articulation more stable than the native hip when the capsule is open? So this concept of getting a very stable prosthetic is again very flawed. So all the three tenets on which the hip replacement was built has to be questioned today. Um, so as, as the concept have changed, what should be the aim now? So we've, uh, you know, we published this uh, 3D balancing. A lot of other groups have also published uh, functional uh, THR restoration rather than anatomical restoration. And this is our paper which was published uh, about five, six years ago where we talked about the three-dimensional balancing of the hip. So the essence in this is that we are not interested in individual femoral and acetabular parameters anymore. We are only interested in combined parameters. Individual parameters have no significance whatsoever. So the first parameter that we are interested in is, is the combined version displayed by Ranavath and Dor. We introduced the term called as composite length and global offset was introduced by Gelberg. So all that we uh, are now uh, interested in is the combined pelvic femoral parameters and individual parameters are not significant anymore. So individual parameters are out, combined parameters are in. So what we are actually doing, whether you, uh, whether you like it or not, accept it or not, is some kind of balancing. We are not restoring anatomy. If you think you are restoring anatomy, that is the wrong concept. We are only doing some kind of balancing. So I talked in my earlier talk, what are the various reference points that we take to make sure that these um, the parameters are correct, the, the spinal parameters, the pelvic obliquity, etc. But whatever you do, you must have a tool to objectively assess the combined pelvic femoral relationship in three dimensions. So you must have some tool. So these days, most of the robotic systems and the navigation system do that. Now, if you don't have that, as I told you, this uh, stitch that we showed you in the morning, the coaxial stitch will also show you a very accurate way of taking combined parameters, combined pelvic femoral parameters, and that's what we're really interested in. Now, there are various uh, methods that have been described, run out spin for technique, etc., etc., but none of them have been very popular. You must ask why all these uh, methods using the caliper, etc., is not very popular. That's because you're not able to standardize the reading that you take pre-dislocation time of trial reduction. You're not able to standardize. Now, you're not able to standardize because you find that the position of flexion, you cannot standardize. So, if you take two points, the, the position of flexion cannot be standardized. So, the only way you can standardize the position of flexion is by taking a lines of two points. So, once you take two lines, and that's why you call it the coaxial line. Once you take two lines, you find that you're able to now standardize the position of flexion of the limb both the time of pre-dislocation and time of trial reduction, now everything starts to fall into place. And they showed you in the live demo, it's very, very accurate. You can use robotics, again doing the same thing, using combined parameters or navigation to get the same. So as the two axes now we use, we're able to. And this is what I showed in the morning. How we get a combined parameter is by trial reduction and finding out which is the largest offset that does not produce any lengthening. So we, we uh, trial with various options that are available to us in the given system that we are using. And then these offset charts are very, very important in my OR. I will never operate without these offset charts. Now, people typically will do a trial reduction and say everything is okay. And then when they put the actual stem in, they'll say the stem is a little loose. I'm going to go for one stem higher. You can go higher, but that stem will have a different offset. You're not taking that into account. So these offset uh, charts are very important. And if, suppose if we need a higher uh, stem, bigger size stem, then we need to again reduce and see whether we got the 3D balance right or not. So as you go up, the offset will increase and every st uh, stem will have their own offsets and we need to be very, very careful about that. So the, the rule is the highest offset of the system that it accommodates without manifesting as an increase in length is the correct global offset of the patient. And that's what we are trying to reproduce. And then you won't get any lengthening. And this is how we uh, look at the combined version. So many times we find if the combined version is way off, too high or too low, we make suitable adjustments to get the combined version where we want. And we showed you how we look at to put a numerical value on the combined version these days. Now, depending on various parameters, we can alter either the acetabular uh, index, acetabular version, the femoral version or both. But the important thing is you cannot compensate too much of one with the other. 
So the cup version must be within both cup version and the ephemeral version must be within 10 to 30 degrees. So that's called as the zone of compensation. Within this zone, you can compensate, but you cannot compensate outside this zone. So stability at trial reduction, which we was all relying on, every surgeon used to you know see whether the hip is stable. That is very spurious because you know as I told you, it'll give you wrong readings. So based on the 3D principle, we have done thousands and thousands of these hips. If these three combined pelvic femoral parameters are accurately restored, the prosthetic articulation will have intrinsic stability like that of the native hip. There is no need to look for stability. And I haven't looked at you know, the uh, trial reduction stability for the last 10 years. Not in a single hip I have done that. If you do these tests, it is prone for errors. The shuck test, I showed you in the morning, the drop kick test and the RM stability, you will think, you will detect spurious instability. The hip is not unstable, but you think it's instable and therefore you increase the offset and therefore you increase the length of the patient. So testing for stability trial reduction can detect spurious instability and can lead to unnecessary lengthening of the limb. So in this group that we published, we had over 1000 cases, we had only two dislocations and both of them had a 28 head. None of the cases in which we had a 28 head, this principle will not work. You may have to lengthen the limb to get stability in a 28 head, but you don't have to lengthen the limb once you get a 32 and a 36 head. That's the point I want to make. So if you have a 32 or a 36 head, there's no need to look for in the, the, you know, the prosthetic stability, quite unnecessary to do that. So you see this example in the, the, the example in the top, you can see the, the, uh, the, the cup on, on the patient's right has been left a little higher, the fuse tip, so you don't have much control over where you're leaving a cup. On the left side, the cup has been left a little lower, it's a fuse tip, so you don't have the landmarks. So you have to compensate on the femoral side. Now if you just look at anatomical restoration, horizontal offset, vertical offset, you're going to go wrong. So based on where the cup is, the stem has to be you know, adjusted to get in three dimensions. That's very important. Another example of a high hip center, and then you need to compensate on the femoral side to get that right. So it's always about combined parameters and not about individual parameters anymore. So the neck shaft angle I told you, so these days we think it's a very important parameter. We look at the pre-op neck shaft angle, and now we have stems, various stems. We have the corail with 128, we have the actress with 131, we have the Korai and the Polar with the 135. So depending on what the neck shaft angle is, we will choose that implant according to the patient's neck shaft angle. And thereby we are able to reproduce the patient's biomechanics much better. So that's what I would do in this patient. For example, in this patient in the top, NSA is 130. And if I use a Korai in that patient, uh, you will get a THR, but not the best THR. It's good, but not great. So you must learn to reproduce NSA as close as possible. And in, in this case, you can see that on one side, I can see the patients in the NSA is only 131 and one side I've used a Korai stem that's before we had the actus and the other side I've used the actus. You can see that the biomechanical restoration on the, on the side of the actus is much better than the one on the one with the Korai stem. So this is the, um, you must uh, be very cognizant of what are the offsets. Uh, they, for example, if you take the, um, the Korai and if you take the, uh, uh, the striker stem, accolade, you see the, uh, the offset of the, uh, uh, the Korai starts at 38, the offset of the um, accolade starts at 33. So completely different systems. One is a non-homothetic transformation, one is a homothetic transformation. So you must understand these offsets and that's how the very, very important tool, the offset charts, when you do the 3D balancing in your OR. So the offsets, you have to be really, really thinking at it. So this is the actus uh, thing. So what are the conceptual differences between these two? Uh, summing up this uh, talk, the traditional method, the Ranavat method, templating anatomic method, that we restored parameters of the socket and stem in individual fashion, but now with 3D functional balancing, we restore using combined parameters. Individual parameters are, are not of any significance anymore. We use the anatomical hit center, but here we preserve bone stock and place the socket as the best available bone, which is usually a few millimeters high. On the uh, initial thing, we did the anatomical restoration, but here we do a functional restoration and balance. And in the initial things, in many cases, when we found the prosthesis was not stable, we increased the length. So LLD was accepted at the cost of stability, but here we do not accept LLD. So if some patient comes and says, doctor, can you guarantee me equal limb length? You must say, yes, I guarantee you. There's no need for you today with the armamentarium that we have to say, sometimes I need to lengthen you to get stability, etc. Not necessary at all. Post-operably, we used to give enforced restriction earlier on, but now we don't give post-op restriction of any kind whatsoever. It's a post approach, but no, from day one, they can do whatever they want. They do sport, they do contact sport, absolutely no issues about that. So it is possible to achieve stability and mobility at the same time today. So thank you for your attention.